Good evening, everyone. I invite you now to put your hymnal away and open up your Bibles to the Old Testament, please. We're going to be studying from the book of Micah today, and we have several visitors with us. We are especially grateful to see you, to meet you, to have you worship with us. Every second Sunday evening of the month, we're striving to study a book of the Bible in about 30 minutes. There are pages in our Bible that are stuck together, and it shouldn't be that way. The whole Bible is important. All Scripture is inspired, and it's profitable for us to train us and help us be the kind of people that God wants us to be. And so in an effort to understand these, these often neglect, neglected books, we are opening up each one, uh, and we're studying from them. And so I encourage you to open up to the book of Micah, the prophet Micah in your Old Testament. It might take you just a few extra seconds to get there. That's just fine. When you consider God, a question we might ask is, who is like you? Who is like the Lord? Especially when we consider his salvation that we sang about from Psalm 18, from Exodus chapter 15, when God acts to save and deliver His people, it causes the Israelites, it causes the faithful simply in stunned amazement to say, who is like the Lord? And that is when His power, His majesty, His glory, His character is put into sharp focus. There is none like Him. There is nobody like God. And I think that's part of what the book of Micah is all about. In fact, that's what the name Micah means. It means who is like the Lord. Just to set the stage of the book, Micah was a man who lived in a small town in the lowlands of Judea in the southern kingdom. And he prophesied uh, just before the fall of the northern kingdom in Samaria, when Assyria came to destroy the northern kingdom, and he prophesied all the way to the reign of Hezekiah, one of the kings in the southern kingdom. Now this is, of course, uh, long after those kingdoms, the north and the south, split. And God had done marvelous, wonderful things. He had shown His steadfast love to them. He had been so gracious to them to give, us, give them all of these wonderful things that they didn't deserve, to give them this wonderful land to live in, to give them this wonderful covenant, to give them the worship, the temple, the promises, all of these wonderful things. And yet God's people just rebelled against Him generation after generation. Both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom are seriously violating God's covenant that they promised to keep at Sinai. And so what God would do during this period of the divided kingdom is He would commission a prophet. And Micah was one of these men that God sent to go straighten His people out to warn them that if they didn't get their act together, spiritually speaking, then God was going to have to come in judgment against them. Now Micah was a contemporary of Isaiah and Hosea. And his message, like most prophets, was a mixture of judgment and hope. In chapter 3, Micah talks about the, the different uh, prophets of the day. And I was actually just talking to David McGoy about this earlier on, that it's very convenient for us that the Bible labels the true prophets from the false prophets for us. But in the day, uh, it wasn't so clear. They didn't go around wearing name tags. Hi, I'm a false prophet. Nice to meet you. Or hi, my name is Micah. I'm a true prophet. I speak for Yahweh. But he's going through and he's talking about the different messages of the false prophets. And he says, but as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, with justice and might. And what is he filled with this power? What is he filled with God's Spirit to do? To declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. And so he spends a lot of the book accusing Israel and warning Israel that God is going to bring Assyria to judge them. He's going to take out the northern kingdom with the rod of his indignation with Assyria. And if the southern kingdom didn't get their act together, 
then he had Babylon on deck to bring an even greater destruction on the temple and on Jerusalem. So most of the book focuses on these accusations and these warnings, but we're going to see as we outline the book that there are these glimmers of hope that are very bright, very hopeful for the restoration of God's people in the future. And so the image uh, uh, that Micah portrays of God is that he's a judge. He's just, he's holy, and he will come and he will scatter his people. But he's also this loving, kingly shepherd who will gather his people when the time comes. Who is like the Lord? Let's find out. I hope it'll be clear as we go through the book. First of all, chapters 1 and 2 are a section about accusations and warnings here. So God poetically appears in judgment hovering over the land of Israel and he is roiling in flame and in anger and smoke and in lightning. He's appearing kind of like he did at the top of Mount Sinai when God's people came to receive the law. But this time he hasn't come to the mountain to deliver a covenant. This time he's coming in judgment for over 500 years of rebellion. And Micah names all of these towns as culprits of rebellion, Gath, Shapir, Adullam, Jerusalem, and Lachish, and how God is going to come against them. He says in verse 2, Hear, you peoples, all of you, chapter 1, verse 2, Pay attention, O earth, and all that is in it. Let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from His holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming out of His place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth, and the mountains will melt under him. The valleys will split open like wax before the fire, like waters poured down a steep place. Why is he coming in, in, this, in this fuming anger against the land? All this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. There's been oppression in God's people by the powerful. And so God sent His prophet Micah to come and accuse these leaders. And these leaders who were running the show, they were getting rich through theft and greed, which is, of course, not the way it should be with God's people. In chapter 2, in verse 2, look at what the leaders were doing. They covet fields and seize them. Oh, I want that piece of property, and I'll do whatever it takes to get it. And they covet houses and take them away. They oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. You know who that sounds like to me? Sounds like Ahab. Remember Ahab in the Old Testament, 1 Kings 21? He coveted Naboth's vineyard. And he cheated and he lied and he stole and he murdered to get it. And the leaders could get away with this. It was all set up. Because they were in cahoots with these prophets, and these prophets were corrupt. Listen to their typical sermon in verse 11. Look at the, what they were saying. God calls it wind and lies. Here's their sermon. I will preach to you of wine and strong drink. This lavish lifestyle. They would be, that's the kind of message of the preacher of their day in verse 11. And so they were offering promises of God's protection really to anybody who could afford to pay them. And so they were preachers for hire, these false prophets. In verse 6, they were, they were saying, Do not preach, thus they preach. One should not preach of such things. Disgrace will not overtake us. People like Isaiah, people like Jeremiah, people like Hosea and Micah here, they weren't welcome. Their message wasn't welcome. They couldn't understand how this God of grace could devise disaster against His own people. But in fact, that's exactly what God was doing. He was devising disaster against the house of Israel. Look at verse 3 of chapter 2. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, against this family I am devising disaster from which you cannot remove your necks. He's made the noose and He's tightening it around His people. Chapter 3, going to chapter 4 at the beginning, is another section of accusations and warnings against God's people. Again, the leaders and the prophets were oppressing the poor. They were conspiring together to run the land basically through bribery. 
Look at what he says at the beginning of chapter 3. And I said, Hear, you heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice? If anyone is to know justice in the land, it ought to be the people who are leading. You should be the shepherds of God's people. But they're the people who hate the good and love the evil. And he, he uh, poetically describes the way that they are treating their brother as tearing the skin off my people, their flesh off their bones, who eat the flesh of my people, flay their skin off of them. It's almost like what Paul was telling the Galatians, you are biting and devouring one another. In fact, that they were bending justice to favor the wealthy. They were depriving the poor of their land. That was their inheritance. That land belonged to a certain family and it wasn't supposed to, according to the law of Moses, it wasn't supposed to be traded outside of that family. It was supposed to be kept within that tribe. And yet they were stealing it. They were seizing it. They were buying it up. And so God says disaster is coming. You're going to oppress my people. I'm going to use a nation to oppress you. Samaria was going to be ruined. In Jerusalem, not long after, in the temple, we're going to be destroyed. And so in chapter 3 and verse 9, Micah says, Hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight, who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. Its heads give judgment for a bribe. Its priests teach for a price. Its prophets practice divination for money, yet they lean on the Lord. And say, is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins, the mountain of the house, a wooded height. So these are some very stiff warnings, very strong language from God. But as we see in all the prophets, judgment is never the last word. Because each one of these sections of warning and woe come a promise of restoration, a promise of hope. If you look at the end of chapter 2, look in verses 12 and 13, where though Israel is sinful in a rebellious house, God says, you guys are just sheep. You're sheep who have gone astray and you'll be scattered into exile because of your sins, but God is going to come like this shepherd king who's going to go out and rescue His people and regather the flock of Israel. And there's going to be a faithful remnant that will be brought back to good pasture. If you look at the beginning of chapter 4, he picks up this idea of a ruined Jerusalem, of a ruined temple. But Micah says destruction is not going to be permanent. It's going to be rebuilt. One day God is going to exalt Jerusalem as the highest mountain. And His presence is going to fill the temple again. And all people from all places are going to flow and stream to this mountain to receive justice, to receive mercy, to learn the law. And God is going to be this great King over all the nations bringing rest and peace. I love what He says in verse 3. Isaiah chapter 2 is very similar to this. Where He says, He shall judge between many peoples and shall decide disputes for strong nations far away and they shall beat their swords into plowshares. I love that image. And their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Here these instruments of devastation and death and ruin are going to be melted down and changed into instruments of cultivation and growth at a time of peace and rest and security. And so these two sections of hope at the end of chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 4 are developed further in the rest of chapter 4 and 5. First of all, in verses 8 through 13 of chapter 4, verses 8 through 13, Micah prophesies that after the Assyrians come and attack, Israel is going to be conquered. And they're going to be exiled to Babylon, which of course is bad news, but God promises that He's going to restore His people back to the land. And that's some of what we're reading uh, through uh, Ezekiel in our Bible study. At the beginning of chapter 5, the first six verses there, that then in this rebuilt Jerusalem, this new shepherd king from the line of David is going to come. And he's going to be born 
in Bethlehem. Are you guys getting a hint of who this shepherd king is that's going to rule? Look at verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, you who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. And he's going to be a great savior if you continue reading there. He's going to deliver Israel from all her enemies. And he's going to rule over his restored people in strength and peace and security. And then at the end there, verses 7 through the rest of the chapter, this new restored people of God who live under the authority of this great Savior, this great King from Bethlehem, they're going to be exalted. They're going to be a blessing to all nations. They're going to be, in verse 7, to the nations like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass, which delay not for a man, nor wait for the children of a man. But at the same time, when God exalts His people, the faithful, He's going to bring final justice. He's going to remove all evil from His people in the world. In verse, uh, verse 12, He's going to cut off sorceries from your hand. Shall, you shall have no more tellers of fortunes. He says in verse 13, I will cut off your carved images and your pillars from among you, and you shall bow down no more to the work of your hands. I will root out your Asherah images from among you and destroy your cities. He's going to purify the land and purify the people. And in anger and wrath, I will execute vengeance on the nations that did not obey. And in this final section, Micah returns to this pattern of warning and then giving hope again. He's going to make some more accusations in chapter 6 about Israel's unjust economy, how it's, how it's a rigged system and how the leaders are destroying the country. They're destroying the people with their greed. Look in verse uh, 11. Shall I acquit the man with wicked scales and with a bag of deceitful weights? Your rich men are full of violence. Your inhabitants speak lies and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Therefore, I strike you with a grievous blow, making you desolate because of your sins. You shall eat but not be satisfied. And there shall be hunger within you. You shall put away, but not preserve. And what you preserve, I will give to the sword. Isn't that sort of another lesson on the side for pursuing wealth at the expense of your neighbor? Pursuing wealth dishonestly, that we want more and more and more, and yet we're never satisfied, and so we do more evil things to get that money. You shall sow, but not reap. You shall tread olives, but not anoint yourselves with oil. You shall tread grapes, but not drink wine. It says, for you have kept the statutes of Omri and all the works of the house of Ahab, and you have walked in their counsels, not mine, but theirs, that I may make you a desolation and your inhabitants a hissing, so you shall bear the scorn of my people. And so they're unjust. And in chapter 6, he sums up what it means to follow God. And if you know anything about the prophet Micah, if you know any of the verses, these are probably the verses that come to mind. Chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, where the prophet says, With what shall I come before the Lord? What do I have to give God, really, when, when we take stock of what we have to give? And bow myself before God on high. Shall I come before Him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Would that be enough? to satisfy God? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? What if we poured oil on the streets of Danville? Would that be enough for God? What if we filled up Hendricks County with rams? Would that be enough for God? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Is that really what God wants? A multitude of sacrifices? He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. These are the very things that Israel has failed to do. And we can see the devastation it's brought in their society. And we're seeing it in our society, of course, today. And when God's people fail in these most basic principles of faith, 
then judgment is unavoidable. Now the northern kingdom was lost to Assyria. And Hezekiah tried to turn the southern kingdom around. He did a marvelous job, but he couldn't change the hearts of the people. He couldn't change the direction of the nation. And so Babylon did come in judgment. Why? Because they weren't doing what verse 8 said. Because they weren't walking humbly with their God. They didn't love kindness. They weren't doing justice. And so judgment had to come. But you see, the book ends with another powerful message of hope in chapter 7. In chapter 7, Micah is sitting alone and he is lamenting Israel's situation in utter shame and defeat. And he knows their days are numbered. He knows that destruction is coming. He knows the temple is going to be ransacked. He knows that they're going to be exiled. But he's waiting and he's watching for God to be merciful. He's still holding out hope. Maybe God won't wipe us off the map forever. He says in chapter 7, in verse 7, But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. You hear His confidence there. And so when you read through these prophets, not just Micah, but all the prophets, really, you just wonder, why should God be merciful? Why would He? Why not just, just start over? Why not you know, just wipe Israel off the map? Israel deserves judgment clearly. Why should God forgive this faithless and rebellious people? Micah gives two basic answers to that question. First of all, it's God's character. God's character. Look at verse 18 at the end of the book. Again, his namesake, who is a God like you? You know, we read uh, Greek myths to our children, very careful, of course, to point out that they're myths. And, of course, they like all the crazy stories and that. But you look at the gods of the Greeks. They're just as wicked as anybody, your, your neighbor. They're cheating on one another. They're destroying one another. They're lying. You can imagine in a setting where there, people believed in all sorts of different gods that you would look at Yahweh, you'd look at the God of the Bible, and you say, who is like you? Who is like the Lord? Look at what the Lord does. Pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of His inheritance, He does not retain His anger forever. Why? Because He delights in steadfast love. Micah knew that about God. Micah knew that God's judgment was never the last word. Sure, judgment was coming. But His heart's desire is to be merciful. His love and His mercy, of course, it demands justice, but He finds no pleasure in the death of the wicked, as God said through Ezekiel. That He wants all people to repent, to come to a knowledge of the truth. This is what Peter is dealing with in 2 Peter chapter 3. Now God promises that judgment is coming. It's going to make the ruination of the temple in Jerusalem look like child's play. He's coming to judge not one city, not one region of the world. He's coming to judge the universe, to judge the whole earth. And people are going to mock you. They're going to say, well, when is He coming? The world keeps turning. It's just like it always has been. And Peter says, now don't think God's forgot. Don't think God is, is, is slow to keep His promise, as some count slowness. Peter says, the reason why the world continues to turn and He's not sent the Lord back is because He's patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. It's in God's character to save and hope the best for humanity, that they would repent and live. The second reason that Micah knows that God is going to extend hope and restoration to His people is because of His promises. Look in verse 20. Back to Micah in chapter 7, the last verse of the book. You will show faithfulness to Jacob. 
and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. How does Micah know that he's not going to wipe Israel off the map? Because he knows God stays true to His Word. That He's always faithful to the things that He said. He made Abraham a promise. He made Isaac the same promise. And Jacob and so on and so forth down the line. And so these final words are a book, are of the book allude to this promise that God made to Abraham long ago. That Abraham, I've selected you. And I'm going to work through your bloodline, your family, to bring blessing not just to the Jews, but to the, all the earth, to all nations. Genesis 12 and verse 3. And his family did become a nation. They became the nation of Israel. And their history is one of unbroken rebellion and sin. And that didn't stop God from keeping His promise. He still managed to keep His promise, but He did so in a very unexpected way. How can God retain His just and holy character and bring judgment on sin while He can still be merciful and loving and kind and compassionate? He sent His Son to die. Do you remember in chapter 6 of Micah? What does the Lord require? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? God gave His firstborn, His only, His unique Son, not for His transgression, but for our transgression. And so God answers the paradox of judgment against sin and His love and mercy towards sinners in the cross of Christ. How did He confront and judge all the evil, past, present, and future of the world? He took on a body. And He allowed the crushing weight of sin to destroy Him on the cross. And it's only through this judgment can we find hope. And it's in the cross of Christ that God proved His covenant love and promise is more powerful than our evil. Now judgment is coming. And judgment is certain. But why did God send Jesus into the world? Do you remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus? God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. It was already condemned. He'd sent the prophets long ago. He sent His Son into the world in order that the world might be saved through Him. That's His desire. That's His wish. It's not to destroy the wicked, but to save them. The wicked will be destroyed if they won't repent. But God's wish is to save them and give them life. It, Micah puts this beautifully in verse 19. This is my favorite verse of the book. He says that God will again have compassion on us. Hasn't He shown enough compassion? He will again have compassion on us. He will trample, He will tread on our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Now this phrase, this last part of the phrase is sort of lost upon us in the 21st century because we have these submersibles that can go down and look at the Titanic that was sunk. But in the ancient world, when you took a stone and you threw it into the River Jordan or you threw it into the Red Sea, it was lost. It was gone. It could never be recovered again. And that's what God is doing for us. That's what He's doing with our sins in the cross of Christ, He's dealing with our sins in a final, definitive way, just like He dealt with Pharaoh's army. You remember what was read in Ezekiel or uh, Exodus 15? Pharaoh's chariots, his host, he cast into the sea. His chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. He says they sank like lead. In verse 11. And did you know that if you join yourself with Jesus, if you follow Him into death, into a grave of water, 
that He will do the same thing with your sins that He did with Pharaoh's army? He will destroy them once and for all and they'll never have power over you again? Do you know that that's what this gospel is about and that's being preached way back here over 2,000 years ago in this prophet? That God takes your sin and He casts it into the sea and it sinks like a stone. It sinks like lead. Or in the words of Jeremiah, I will remember their sin no more. Why? Because He somehow forgot? No. Because it's paid for. It's done with. The bill has been paid. Or as the psalmist puts it, He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Who is like God? For as high as the heavens are above the earth, how can you possibly quantify that? So great is His steadfast love towards those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, how far is that? So far does He remove our transgressions from us. But do you know that these words are only true in Jesus Christ. That if you're outside of Jesus Christ, then these words of hope do not apply to your situation. And that's why God sent His Son into the world. To bring judgment, to warn us, but to also give us hope for the future. Because there's going to come a time when it's all going to end. And you're going to hear your last sermon. And you're going to open your Bible for the last time. And if you never acted, that's the way it's going to be. And you can't blame God for not giving you the chance. He doesn't deal with us according to our transgressions. He gives us chance after chance after chance to repent and live. And God's final answer to this sin problem is His Son, Jesus Christ. I'll tell you, when Rachel and I were trying to understand the Gospel, and just so happens Brother Dickey here was the one preaching, we didn't understand who Micah was. We didn't understand who Hezekiah was. We didn't get the big picture. But we knew that we needed to be saved. And there might be someone here who understands that about themselves. And you need the forgiveness that's available in Christ. And if you read those poetic verses, and you don't want God to remember your sin, and you'd like for Him to take your sin and cast it into the sea, never to resurface again, then I'm pleading with you to be baptized tonight, to become a Christian, and to follow Jesus into His death, so that you can follow Jesus into His life. If you are a Christian and you have failed to keep your covenant promise to God, then we can pray for you and we can help you overcome that in Christ. 